Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Michael Zuber, one rental at a time, and it is Monday, and we start off strong. We have our expert, Mr. Greg Dickerson. How are you doing, sir? Doing great, Michael. How are you today? I'm doing great, man. Thank you for asking. So uh, I've been waiting to ask you this question. Uh, you know, we had the ruling from the Supreme Court late Thursday of last week. Uh, we also, so the CDC eviction moratorium is unconstitutional. Uh, evictions can now start, and I think 44 states. I think there are six states uh, where they have state-based moratoriums going longer, California being one of them, New Jersey another. Um, but what I want to talk about there is, you know, do we think that now that the CDC, now that evictions can start, do we see that potentially unlocking inventory that was maybe stuck? Um, you know, maybe there were owners that's like, hey, I'd want to sell, but I can't take, I'm not going to take a huge discount because my tenant's not paying. And then we might as well work in uh, for uh, forbearance, mortgage forbearance. It started, this is all, I think it's Black Knight that does this. It started as high as 4.1. It's now 1.5 million mortgages earned forbearance. So all of that said, is there a wave of inventory coming, a trickle, you know, in any gut opinions on all of that? There's really no way to really know until it happens. Now, there are some people I know that have investment properties that don't want to deal with anything else moving forward once they remove tenants. Mm -hmm. I know some that have sold their properties with tenants in place. Yep. So you're going to have a mixture of all of that. And there's really no way to know. Um, the bulk of the investment properties that are owned in this country are owned by individual owners, mom and yep. pop owners, people like you, people like me that mm -hmm. invest in properties, things like that. Um, they're not largely owned by institutions. And, you know, those are just facts and numbers that everybody can back check. Mm -hmm. um, so the real question is, you know, what is the appetite of the owners at the end of the day that don't want to have to deal with something like this again? So, yeah, you know, is it enough to make a dent in the housing market? I doubt it. You know, there's yeah. a lot of demand, pent up demand out there for investors, for, um, you know, owner occupants. So I think any of that type of potential inventory, even if everybody capitulated and said, I'm done renting houses, I think there's enough demand out there to, to buy them up. Yeah, I've been, I've been thinking about this for a while, right? There's, there's, you know, there's a, I don't know, a spectrum of, of housing units. And generally speaking, again, I, you know, I'm the one rental at a time guy, right? So I've been talking to landlords for 14 months now since this CDC has come in. And you're right, some have, some have capitulated early, right? Hey, I'm done. I'm going to sell tenant occupied, you know, and, and cash out. Uh, most of the ones I talked to, the talk track was, because again, you got to hear talk track and then what do they actually do? Lots of them. I don't know, probably 70% of the ones I talked to who own the property more than 10 years. So they're older, right? They're not just new landlords. They're like, Michael, once this thing gets over, uh, I'm going to kick them out and I'm going to remodel and I'm going to sell into a hot seller's market, right? The seller, we've had a seller's market I don't know, for a couple of years now, just crazy, right? There's only 1.32 million homes available. So that was the talk track. And again, it would be kind of the, it would be kind of the missing piece of our housing market, right? We are missing the low end. A lot of the transactions have been because of the K-shaped recovery, a lot of the, you know, uh, above the median across the country. Uh, but you're right. I think it'll be interesting to see if they follow through because what else have we seen? I just talked about today, Craig, there, there's a, like, Boise, Idaho rents are up 39% in a year. Yeah. It's like, what? So uh, I'm suspecting there's a lot of landlords that are going to, you know, remove the problem tenant. They're going to look at the rental market going, I can get what for my house? And they're going to keep them. That's, that's what I think is going to happen, but I don't know. Yeah, there's a lot of demand in, you know, the migration states where people went to, mm -hmm. you know, during the pandemic, put a lot of pressure on, all kinds of inventory, rentals, you know, permanent housing. Yeah. So there's big rental demand. Rents are up 20, 30, 40% in some markets and, wow. you know, pockets in some areas. They were down in some other areas where people were, were leaving. But, you know, at the end of the day, housing is just one of the best investments you can make from an income property, you know, income standpoint in terms of the income producing asset with tax offsets, things like that. So there's always going to be demand from investors. And right now, this demand for, buyers is it's solely interest rate driven and as yeah. long as the rates remain as low as they are you know the affordability index of a monthly payment is pretty low right now in comparison to incomes probably i think you and i did the charts lower than it's probably ever been um, in yeah. the history of housing uh, from a payment standpoint and again that's what people are buying is they're buying payments it's all the housing market is artificially propped up by interest rates and as soon as that demand 
uh, as soon as the rates rise and demand drops, that'll put more pressure on rental housing. Yeah, absolutely will. Yeah, it's, it's I, again, I was just doing the math because again, I was, you know, I don't know, four months ago, I was like, oh my God, we're going to lose 20% of affordable housing, right? Just because all the landlords I talked to are like, I'm done. I bought these things in the 90s. I'm, I'm too old. I, the government shouldn't be in my business. Why am I suffering? You know, all that talk track, right? But now that we're on the other side, I, I'm already hearing landlords going, Michael, the last tenant I got 1200 for this house, I think I can get 1850. And I'm like, cool. Uh, oh, by the way, Michael, I, I refied my mortgage during this crisis and I went from a 5.875 to, you know, 3.125. You know, and I'm like, fix, right? Yep, fix. I'm like, well, let's see. If your payment went down 250 bucks and your rent goes up 600 bucks, how's that feel? It feels pretty good. I'm like, so you're going to sell? Hell no. So I think, I think we're, I think, I don't know. I just don't know. I mean, how many people are going to be fed up with this and sell versus look at the picture and going, wow, you know, never been a better time to be a landlord. You'll have some, but you know, again, is it enough to make a dent in demand for the product? No. Yeah. I you think know, it's I mean, going to be a lot. You're talking about yeah. millions of people and in, in a healthy housing market, you're talking I mean, how many properties sell each year in a normal housing market? I don't know. It's about 6 million. Yeah. So, you know, I doubt you're going to see that much. And a lot of it's multifamily. So a lot of this moratorium and eviction issues are mostly, you know, multifamily, you know, mm -hmm. those types of things. You're not single family houses and multifamily investors. It's, you know, maybe 5% of their tenants are in this program and, yeah. you know, aren't paying. And there's relief for landlords. There's relief for tenants. So yeah, um, I, I don't think that's enough to make a dent. And yeah. You know, I was, I was pretty certain we were going to lose 10%, but that was kind of in the throes of it. Again, it's, it's, it's always that classic thing. Don't watch what people say, watch what they do. Yeah. And I already see landlords who I were certain we're going to sell. Like they were just like venom, like, Rah! and now they're like, oh, maybe not so bad on the other side. Yeah. They so, probably have a waiting list, you know, yeah, to, exactly. to rent the property. Uh, you know what I mean? Cause it, it, there's so much demand out there. And as soon as they can, you know, get people out of the property or get them paying or get yeah. relief, whatever the program is. And their, you know, their plan is at the end of the day, I think there's going to be people waiting for those units. So let's, uh, let's now go to uh, mortgage forbearance. So that's eviction CDC behind us. We'll actually see what happens with rentals. Well, that's residential and commercial, whole different ballgame. Oh, you know, different ballgame. Oh, yeah, yeah. A lot of stuff there is still in serious trouble. Oh, I agree. I, I believe the housing, I believe the people talking housing crash should just tweak it to multifamily or commercial crash because it ain't happening in residential shopping mall crash. Yeah, exactly. Office crash. Um, so let's talk about the mortgage forbearance, right? This is, this was a scary stat, but again, I've been through the, the last crash. So it wasn't nearly as scary to me started as the highest number I saw from black Knight was 4.1 million mortgages were in forbearance. It's now 1.5. So that means 2.6 million cured. Um, you think suddenly this 1.5 million is going to hit the market and just decimate you know, owner-occupied housing? No, I mean, even again, if 1.5 million houses hit the market today, they would all get absorbed. So yeah. there's so much demand out there, you would get them sold before it creates any kind of a problem. And you saw the numbers yourself, you know, when you go look at Black Knight data, or if you just Google that term, you know, mm -hmm. mortgage forbearance, you'll see that out of those 2 million that are cured, most of them stayed in their houses. Some of them sold. Very few ended up going back to the banks. Very few. Yeah, this is from memory. I did a video on it because, again, people talking about this wave of foreclosures don't understand basic math. Um, so I believe it was 20, a quarter of them. Let's just round them to round numbers. A quarter of the people that got cured never missed a payment. Mm -hmm. Another quarter caught up. So half of them either kept paying or had the money to cure what they were behind. So of the 2.6, 1.3 million of them just cured. They had the money. They're good. Uh, the next biggest bunch, uh, they reset the term, right? They went from, you know, 26 years left to 30, sometimes 40. Uh, they did stick payments on the back as seconds, 0%. Uh, but long story short, less than 1% were, were, became a motivated sale, meaning they didn't have any equity and they, they had a short sale or deed in lieu or something of that nature. Less than 1%. That's like yeah, 30,000 you know, homes. 
the housing market bears, you know, the people that are calling for the crash, they're looking at 2009, whole different situation, whole different environment. Mm -hmm. And the biggest difference out of all of it is the banks were not working with anybody or even willing to work with anybody back then. Whereas this go around, they were in the front door before anything yeah. happened. And Check said, this box don't... on this website. You're good. What? Right. <laughs> right. Now, if they'd have done that in 2008 and 2009, that would have saved a lot oh. of people a lot of pain. Um, it would have saved the economy a lot of pain. I mean, it's exactly. to me, it's mind boggling that they couldn't step up to the plate last time and do what they're doing now. And now they've overstepped it. So yeah, they, they've exactly. gone to the extreme the other way. So I'm extremely bullish on the housing market. Um, even in commercial, I'm, I'm extremely bullish there long term because there's a lot of redevelopment opportunities and there's so much pent up demand because we haven't been able to deliver units. So again, exactly. housing, real estate, commercial, residential, doesn't matter what it is, it's supply demand. The crashes that we've seen, forget 2008 and 9, there was a little bit of oversupply then. But generally, when you see real estate crashes in the history of real estate, it's been oversupply, too much development, not enough demand. So it's just supply demand and it happens, boom and bust cycles in real estate and in commercial yep. and in construction, it's been the way it's been forever. So right now we are three or four years backlog. If you could put everybody to work right now and start building through the demand that's out there, it would take three or four years to deliver enough housing units to the market. That's funny. I talked about that this morning on my daily financial news when pe people, and you know, because again, I've been in housing for 20 years. I've you know studied economics since I was in college and it is a supply demand thing, but it's even, it's, you just hit the big, you just hit the big like bullseye to me. Demand moves faster than supply, right? Just talk Boise, Idaho. We go through the shutdown, people work from home, people in California, Washington, these west, these, these coastal towns are like, I'm getting out of Dodge. I don't like the politics. I don't like this. I don't like that. And then they go to a market with 100,000 units or 120,000 units. It doesn't take but 5,000 new people with cash from selling their homes to just totally change the market overnight. Because again, supply doesn't come that fast, right? They're now building new communities and all of that. But those are years into the future. Uh, supply the populations just growing, and you know, I'm I'm assuming we're going to have somewhat of a baby boom coming out of the pandemic years. Uh, a lot of people just like you know the the mm -hmm. war years. Yep. You know, we had the big baby booms. Yeah, that's so true. you know, populations increasing. We've had supply chain constraints, labor constraints. It takes longer to deliver units to the market. You have uh, a lot of construction that's being built for rent instead of for sale. So for an end buyer yeah. for sale, you know, housing market metrics. There's there's huge supply shock and supply you know constraints right now. Lumber's come down, yep. but labor hasn't been resolved yet. And until we resolve that part of the equation, uh, and even supply chain, you know, still with the Delta variant, you know, the, the constraints that we have there and the issues we have in the supply chain, container costs, uh, yeah, shipments, delayed, forty grand or used to be eight. Yeah, it's yeah, crazy. it's crazy. So it's you know there's still a lot of issues out there, and you know, but it's again, it's all hyper local. So you're going to have pockets where everybody left, and you're going to have. Um, supply there in excess of the demand. So what happens? Well, people see that like New York City and mm -hmm. they start moving back in. So New yeah. York City is back on the upswing again. It is. Um, big even time. San Francisco, I've heard that that's back on the upswing again with yep. a lot of people that left. A lot of people are moving in. Um, yeah. So yeah, again, I, it's funny. I looked at those numbers this morning, right? Because again, there was a chart. Um, let me get it. I think I have my notes right here. One sec. Yeah. It's all cycles. And again, I'm, I'm bullish to the max on the housing market, on the real estate market until interest rates change. We get over 4%, you know, oh. I'm, I'm a bear. 4%. Okay. That's so here's my the number. 4%. Here, here's the rents. Uh, is, again, these are crazy in me. Boise, Idaho up 39%. Uh, Spokane, Washington, 32. Fresno, 26. Gilbert, 20, Arizona, 24. Glendale, 24. Tampa, 24. And Las Vegas, 23%. Crazy. Yeah. And what you got to think about too is it sounds like a lot, but if you're renting a house for eight, 900 a month, you know, going up 20, 30% is not a huge amount in the whole scheme of things, especially if you haven't raised rents in, you know, in a while. So, um, you know, you start getting up into $2,000 a month rents, it's a little different, but yeah. Yeah. These are, these are mainly tertiary cities. Yeah. It's, it's going to be interesting. And again, the other thing that's going on is um, property taxes are going up, right? I, a, a student of mine sent me a, a snapshot of his tax statement. It went up 100% year on year, 98% technically, 98%. Oh yeah, cost of ownership's going up exponentially. So it, it could potentially be a wash at the end of the day because taxes are going to go up. Insurances are going up. You know, mm -hmm. all the natural disasters we're having everywhere. You know, insurance company is going to spread that out across, you know, yeah. the country. So you'll see premiums go up. 
Um, you know, utilities have gone up. They can yeah. they consistently go up. So yeah. we're in an inflationary environment right now across the board at all levels from wages. Wages mm-hmm. are up right now. And because of the com- competitive labor market or job market where employers can't get enough people, there's more jobs than workers right now mm-hmm. or people looking for work until the end of September mm-hmm. uh, when that unemployment benefit expires. September 6th, actually. To. September 6th. Oh, okay. The beginning of September. So yeah, just after Labor Day. So whoever made that one was very smart. Like yeah. one last weekend. <laughs> Yeah, exactly, exactly. So again, I just want to go back to something you said, because I think you're you're spot on, right? You're basically bullish on housing as long as we can keep the 30 year, the 30 year fix below 4%. Yeah, well, even, even short term rates, okay, you know, below 4%, because, you know, interest only, that's your construction loans, that's your okay. development loans, you know, stuff like that. If that, and even that's not bad. Again, in my heyday, I mean, I've been building and developing for 20 years. Or, or more, 23, 24, 25, whatever. I can't keep track anymore, <laughs> but since 1997. And I was paying nine and three quarters percent interest on my construction loads. Wow. So even four or five is still phenomenally low. The problem is land prices, construction costs have gone up exponentially. Right. So, you know, that offset, you know, is there. So I think 4% is the magic number across the board. You will see everything come to a halt in the real estate market if we start crossing 4%, because that's just... You know, that's like $3 gas and, you know, where you're at, it might be four, it might be the number. I, right. Very my cool. area, you get over $3 in gas, that changes behavior. Yeah, exactly. It's behavior change, consumer change. This has been a lot of fun. Video number two is going to be negative rates. We've kind of touched on that in, in this conversation with inflation and rates. We'll do that more depth in topic number two. But before we do that, Greg, how can people follow you? GregDickerson.com. Everything's there. My YouTube channel, podcast, uh, go check it out. I talk about all kinds of stuff, real estate, entrepreneurship, um, gregdickerson.com. Yeah. Do yourself a favor, follow Mr. Greg Dickerson. He covers all kinds of topics and has a wide, wide range of experience. Thanks buddy.